Welcome back to Danny Rance. Today we have the Queen of the Underground, the Queen of Revolver, none other than Sunshine in front of me. How are you today, Sunny? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming down. I've been looking really forward to this one today, so we'll get stuck into it. Firstly, for people that don't know who you are, who are you and what are you about? Uh, well, Sunshine's my real name. It's Sunshine Rosie Trot. Actually, your real name. It is, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, I could draw my whole name. <laughs> I, thought, I legit thought that was like your stage name. No, no, it's not. I asked my parents why they called me that. My mum was like, oh, the sun was shining on when you when you were born. And I was born at 10 past nine, I think, at night. So I think she just must have been looking at the... That's a mad like, name. hospital lights or something, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's me. And then I do what I do because ever since I was like... I reckon 12, 13, when I discovered the rave scene in Perth, music is just what I live for. And, yeah, that's when I discovered DJing as well. So but, you yeah. obviously your family has called you Sunshine, so I'm assuming that your mum's a hippie. Um, is that a good assumption? Um, yeah, she probably wouldn't like that, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they both are. My dad lives off the grid and my mum, yeah, they're both hippies but in different ways. Yeah, I get you, yeah. yeah. So Perth, you were born in Perth, you grew up in Perth, and this is something that I know I talked no, about before. No, I'm not. No. You're not from Perth. I, I will... Yes, I lived in, in Perth from when I was about eight. Yep. But I was born in Ballagin in New South Wales. Okay. Which is like a hippie kind of town in yep. northern New South Wales. And um, grew up kind of off the grid out there and then travelled around Australia in a big bus and then kind of landed in Perth. Yeah. Because my like, grandparents and uh, on both sides are from WA. So, and like what, how long were you in Perth for? Uh, from like eight to 16. So when I was 16, I decided raves and DJing is for me. Yep. And that <laughs> basically I heard the Melbourne scene was good and I caught a one-way bus ticket to Melbourne. So when you're in Perth, right? So like when I think of like raves and I think of like dance music, I don't think of Perth straight away, right? Maybe that's, yeah. maybe that's naive of me. But like what did it look like when you were 13 going to these illegal raves? Um, honestly, that was sick. So when I was like 13... I remember discovering a clothing shop um, that sold like rave wear and in there were some rave flyers and you called up a number on the day of the gig and um, you got told a location to wait, like a corner in the city or something. And then like, remember one, this one party desert storm that I went to, this like you drove past with all like hazmat gear, these guys, and they threw up maps to where this warehouse was. And then you'd follow the map to where the warehouse was. So it was... I don't like looking back on it now. I think Perth had a really sick underground rave scene. Like maybe it was only a few hundred people at the party, or five hundred or whatever. But it was really underground music, and I think they modelled the UK scene a lot yeah. after going to London and going to some raves there. Yeah. And what kind of genre were they playing back then? Uh, happy hardcore. Yeah. And but the thing is, because the scene was so small, everyone would go to every genre. So there'd be like happy hardcore, drum and bass. Then you'll be going to see Richie Horton on a Monday night. And then it might be DJ Crush, which is like hip hop and breaks. What, like 13, 14, you were watching like Richie Horton? Yeah. That's fucking mad. <laughs> Till with the, there was like 50 people or something. Yeah. yeah. It was sick. Yeah. And so, so I'm guessing they were checking IDs at these events. Uh, well, back in those days, you could go to like the equivalent of Office Works and just um, like have a photo of yourself and your name and date of birth and just. Just make a little cut. Yeah, no scan <laughs> yeah, tech back yeah, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, or you just get a friend who looks like you and then use their license. Yeah, I think that's the age old yeah. ID fucking way around it, right? Yeah. So you listen to the music, you sort of fall in love into it in the rave scene and whatnot. You stay, you're in Perth for another, so three to four years. Yeah. Do you start playing music there or are you still just a consumer, like, or, you know, patron? Um, so, patron at first. And then I remember I was like, um, at these warehouse rave and I, I remember the moment on the dance where I was watching this um this DJ I think they might have been from Melbourne I can't remember their name maybe Scott Alien or something yep I could be wrong but he was playing anyway and I just remember the energy of like the DJ mixing the two records together and the kind of the energy that that like built in the room and I didn't 100% understand what was happening but the, the way that it made everyone feel in the dance room, looking around and everyone was equal, whether it was a girl, guy, gay, straight, whatever. And I was like, oh, my God, that's what I want to do, basically. And I just, like, in that moment went, I want to DJ. Yeah, wow. And told my friends, I'm like, that's it, I'm going to DJ, I'm going to move to Melbourne, <laughs> this and that. And then I went to go research the club set or the rave scene in Australia and went to Sydney first. And then that 
wasn't quite for me. So, yeah. What was that? Just different? Um, Actually, how do I know it was? Oh, actually, I went to some stadium raves there that were really sick with, like, MCs and stuff, like, yeah. back in those days. And my friend at the same time had gone to Melbourne and she was saying how good Melbourne was. So, I think... That yeah. was like full, like what, what kind of this raves would, were you got when you landed in Melbourne? This would have been like 1995. Yeah, that was like peak, thing. right? That was yeah. like Brunswick Street rave and that sort of shit, yeah? So, no, this was when I went to Sydney. Yeah, And okay. then uh, then I started, that's where I bought my first record. My first record was Tori Amos, Professional Widow, the Armin Van Helden remix. Yeah. Uh, and a, a few other happy hardcore records that I bought in Central Station in Sydney. And then I went back to Perth and kept buying vinyl until I got about a crate's worth. And then that's when I moved to Melbourne. So did you so ever I, actually play in Perth? No, nah, like at some kick-ons. <laughs> 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 and it's not yet. Learning to play vinyl at kick-ons <laughs> when you've had a big night. <laughs> yeah, because like, people like would have paranoia known. paranoia essential. You're like... Because <laughs> 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 people would have known how hard it is. Like vinyl, t- like I have done both. Could yeah. never ever get vinyl to work. Like it's like trying to chase that beat to stay <laughs> in is like, I don't know how people do it. But so yeah. you learn on vinyl originally. I did, yeah. And so when I moved to Melbourne, uh, like for the first year and a half, I swear every thought during the day, first thing I thought of when I woke up was like, oh my God, I need turntables, I need turntables, I need turntables. And back then I was 16, I had no money, would work like sandwich hand jobs here and stuff. And like, it was just impossible to save like 1500 bucks. For sure, 100. For what I needed, yeah. And then eventually my mum ended up lending me the money. And then like for my birthday that year, like said, don't worry about paying me back, which was massive from when you're like 16, or like bull my eyes out. But when I got my turntables, uh, I practiced for an hour a day, no matter whether I was hungover, sick or whatever, for about a year and a half before I did my first gig. Yeah, wow. So, so yeah. you were self-taught then, no one taught you? Or did you yeah, have people? I was self-taught. And still, I've had people comment on the way that I mix, like other DJs, and <laughs> maybe I do, I mix on the second beat always, like I don't mix on the first, I do a few things that I've just taught myself. Yeah. Yeah. And there was, would have been no YouTube or something, anything like that back then, right? Nah, and like, so how'd you actually figure it out? Figure it out? Um, I would study DJ mixes that I loved and listen to that. And then uh, to, uh, to be, a, it was ages where I'd mix like the second beat on the fourth beat of the other record and like it took me ages to work out that you had to do the same beat. On yeah. like I can't even imagine self records. teaching yourself back then. Like, cause like now, you know, you YouTube or you can, yeah. there's all these different rules and stuff you can use, but like back, it's so much more challenging on vinyl. Yeah. But to actually figure it out, like I know it's basic now and you know it, but when you don't, like fuck, that would have been like a bit of a journey. Uh, well, uh, but that's also how I developed my own style as well, I think. And like my first DJ gigs that I got were like, I was playing hip hop, funk, soul, disco, into house, into like heaps of different genres. So I really learned a lot about how to put a set together without even beat mixing yeah. and then beat mixing different genres together and how to like I, the, the way I approach a set is I don't think about these tracks suit each other because they're the same genre. I think about the feeling of each track. Mm-hmm. So it could be a drum and bass track into a techno track into some hip hop kind of thing, but they all have the same feel, so it goes together quite well. And I think I learnt that just doing it on my own. I get you. It's interesting because there was no rules. Do you know what I mean? I didn't know that you're meant to do this or you're meant to do that. Yeah. 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 Hundred percent. That's a really good yeah. point. It's funny because I was the same. I actually wanted to be a DJ, and the reason why I did, became a promoter was because I couldn't afford decks. <laughs> so I went. I went trying to get like, like I'll a promote and try. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to try to get to JB Hi-Fi, and back then they had like it was like fucking lay by or whatever. Yeah. And I did all the paperwork and got rejected yeah. for the decks, and I was like, fuck it, what am I going to do? And then I fell into becoming a promoter because I basically I was a failed DJ from before I even started. <laughs> <laughs> but the same the same emotions that like I got from when I first went out, but yeah. like mirror what you were talking about. So you come to you go to Sydney, end up moving to Melbourne. Yeah. Um, Melbourne, you know, pretty it's a big city. It's different than Perth in a sense. Like um, the population is fucking no doubt, no doubt, 10, 20 times more. How do you sort of break your way? First, before actually I say that, when you told your parents you wanted to leave Perth at sixteen to move to another state to become a DJ, what was their reaction? Um. So, uh, well, my parents were split up and lived <laughs> different sides of the country. But I was very rebellious when I was like very like when I was younger and stuff uh, I pretty much just mum I'm leaving <laughs> I'm moving to Melbourne to DJ so I think uh, she wasn't too happy about it because I didn't finish school but I wasn't really that into school yeah 
at the time. <laughs> I was trying to envision Tom and Tate at 16, like, hey, I'm going to go to another state to DJ. But obviously it happened. Hey, but at the yeah. time when you said it, they would have been like, what the fuck? Yeah, I'll, I love music. Uh, yeah, no, she didn't like it, but I just bought my bus ticket. I yep. here, packed all my stuff and left. And uh, oh, it was funny, I was talking to a friend from Perth recently and she was reminding me of when I was, like, when we used to hang out, when we were like 12, 13 and go to raves, how I used to always just talk about, how I'm going to be a DJ and I'm going to move to Melbourne, I'm going to do this. And she goes, you're the only friend that I know who's like done all the things they said they were going to do. 100%. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. I was going back to that first question I was sort of talking about before. So you, you land in Melbourne, you're 16, yeah. 17 years old. Um, you, you teach yourself how to DJ. Like, how do you get entrenched in the community? Because now, like, when you think of Melbourne, you think of, you know, yourself and your peers. But, like, I, the fact that you weren't even born here is kind of crazy because you're, you're an institution in yourself. But it's like, how, how did you get into that position? Well, I reckon that within the first week of coming to Melbourne, like, I first lived in Paran for years. Uh, and the first party that I went to was, like, Derek Carter... Willie Tell, back in the Willie Tell era. Yep. And um, Shay Demier at the Palace, which was, yeah, sick, mad. And I don't know, I just met some people and uh, then I started going to Revolver when I was like 16. <laughs> I was tall, so <laughs> always been tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly why. <laughs> and back then it was before recovery. So it was, um, I started going there during the week and then, uh, you know, what I reckon would have been in the first couple of months I was buying records at like hardware um when that used to be on is it IZ Street or something in Paran um or no that? I don't remember I remember Rhythm and Soul off uh Greville yeah there used to be hardware records as yeah. well and that I wasn't remember, nothing to do with Richie right pardon it was nothing to do with Richie yeah yeah, yeah. oh Richie owned it yeah oh wow well, I didn't know that yeah well back in those days you didn't buy stuff like music online and uh that'd be like a really mad community at all the record stores so as a young little DJ or wannabe or, or whatever, <laughs> or an established DJ, everyone would shop at the record store. So like a great place to kind of hang out, hang out and chat people. to people and like, yeah. I remember that, man. I remember like being like a frother, like going there and like seeing guys like, you know, like the, the people who were playing at the clubs I was watching, but coming in and buying records and I was sort of oh, just like oh, hanging around. Buy? Yeah, smoking darts, <laughs> listening to I bet you got a lot of rhythm and soul records. <laughs> Because well, you used to be able to listen to stuff there, remember? Yeah. And then yeah. the guys would know what you're into. So as soon as yeah. you come in, they'd be like, check this out, check this out, check this yeah. out. I was buying CDs, not vinyls. But it was like, that was sort of, you know, that was another part too. Like even like T-Rex, Free Show, Disco, the first album, yeah. I was introduced to that fire rhythm and soul on Greville Street. Like the guys yeah. like, I reckon you'll like this. And then that was how I ended up getting into T-Rex. Yeah, and like so, oh. the, things are different back then. Like it wasn't the same. Like the music was, the way you learned and found out about stuff was just so much slower. I, did, I just had a memory like <laughs> come to me. When I was in Perth before I moved here, that's right. One of the main reasons why I moved to Melbourne too is I started buying vinyl over the phone from Melbourne, from Rhythm and Soul. Yeah, And wow. like, uh, I'm pretty sure it would have been Steve playing me records <laughs> over the phone. <laughs> With it, like Yeah, and then I'd get like records sent over. <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically uh, I would be buying records at Hardware or Rhythm and Soul and would go past Revolver and... Um, like this was, yeah, in, within the first couple of months and like during the day and I remember I was chatting to one of the bar guys and he's like, oh, why have you got your records? And then I was telling him how I moved to you on a DJ and kind of for decks and he's like, oh, well, why don't you just come in and use ours? And so I started going in before even playing at Revolver and just messing around on the turntables trying to learn how to mix why people were having coffees. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So what was it before that? Like before it was like, you know, the institution it is now. What well, was it I was still revolved. It was just um, like the, the night times were really popular. Yeah. Yeah. So and it was still the same place. It's just the recoveries hadn't started. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so when did, when did your first gig in Melbourne? Like when do you play, you actually start to entertain audiences? Uh, I reckon it would have been... Maybe after a, a, a year or, so, or after I'd got my turntable, or like a year and a half after getting those and telling everyone I meet, I want to be a DJ. <laughs> I was just so into it. I still am. Um, but I was at a side party at a drum and bass gig. Actually. Yep. Oh, sorry. A side room at a drum and bass gig. And uh, I couldn't mix yet. And I was like shitting myself. <laughs> and I ended up working out my one hour set and writing down like each record and I didn't beat mix any tracks. I just kind of would play like a, um, a breakbeat 
track into a drum and bass track into a hip hop thing and I'd work out like breakdowns where to mix beats in or like, yeah, it was basically sound design yeah. of my set and that's how I kind of got through that set. I mean, there was no one there except for my like five friends who came. <laughs> but yeah, that was my first gig. So when you came here, were you just by yourself or did you have someone with you? Uh, so my best friend had moved before me, yeah. Okay, so there was at least one familiar one, friend. Yeah, but funnily enough, when I moved here, she got into a different scene to me. So I, I met, like, people who were into the same music that I was into and started going at the same parties and stuff, and then she started going to different different events. Yeah. What were some of those parties that you were coming to when you first landed, other than Revolver? Um, I remember going in the mansion. I remember going to Dome, like yeah, Viper wow. Room. Um, all the, like, the Global Village. I don't the, remember. At, the, at that big warehouse in Footscray. Um, and, oh, the Chevron and Freakazoid. <laughs> yeah. That was sad. Wow, yeah? that was sick. Yeah, that was so good. Yeah, loved it. Yeah. It was, um, and I still love, like, Peter McNamara's set on the Sunday morning, like, all these, like, vocal... Soulful, uplifting house, yeah. So then Revolver, right? So Revolver's played such a big part of your life and your sort of career. Well, uh, you know what? I just, so like with Freakazoid, I remember going there and shutting and then we're working out what to do and we went to Revolver and this was before the Boogs days even and they'd started the recovery and it was Krusty playing, which was like a doof kind of DJ. Like I think he was playing trance and side trance and that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, I remember thinking this isn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> Although I've rewind to now, now light trance and side trance. <laughs> Back then, no. Um, yeah, or I just hadn't had that moment where you hear a like, genre of music or find a track that you love. Totally, and yeah. Then, I feel like and then you're like, oh, my God, I'm sold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some of the, I feel like sometimes it's like I'm the same. Like my, my genre pool is like so large yeah. that it's like side trance. When I first heard it, I was like, this is horrible. And then I watched, I went to a Psytrance gig and I watched people engage with Psytrance and now I'm like, I fucking love Psytrance. Yeah, I love it too. My yeah. heart's like bangers. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it up. Yeah. <laughs> so when does, when does Revolver sort of start for you? Like when do you, you know, play your first gig there and when does that sort of journey start that, you know, it's been 20 yeah, years now? Yeah, I know. Oh, oh, well, I've done Saturday mornings over 21 years now. So wow. I've been playing at Revolver. That would mean like 25 years or six years. Wow. A long time. Um, so I think my first gig at Revolver was um, Paz, who still plays on the Saturdays and stuff that he used to run Fridays and we became like good mates and stuff and he really loved my music and put me on like the early set on a Friday and from memory it was like 6pm or something. So I did that a bit and then, um, then they ended up offering me the Wednesday night residency, which was 12.30am to 3am. I was getting like 20 bucks an hour, I think, or 25, which was like my cab fare. <laughs> um, but that's where I learned how to build a dance floor. Back then, there'd be like 150 people that would go like every Wednesday and I'd play like Moody Man kind of house and disco and then like some like De La Soul hip hop. And like I really learned how to kind of get people off the couches and, and dance. And I did that for a few years. And then... Um, Viva L'Amour, she used to play Saturday mornings and uh, I think she, I should do every second week. And there was another DJ who did the, the off weeks and she invited me down like as a guest and I did one set with her and I was like, oh my God, I love this, this is so fucking good. And, uh, and she, she ended up, I didn't realise, was on her way out to like to do other things. So uh, just from that set and I got offered to do Saturday mornings on the, every second week and after a month, they were like so happy with what I was doing that I got offered it every week. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and there's like, so there's like, back, that was when Boog, Spacey, yourself, you know, t -Rack, all those sort of guys, like, were they before you or were you all sort of the same time that you sort of, you know, started to call Revolver home? Um, so I think maybe Boogs and I are the same, about the same, or even, or maybe Boogs is a bit longer at Revolver or, yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> I know t Rick. I, I used to give a gig on a Saturday morning and then that's how he became a resident. Yep. We were chatting about it recently. Um, and and I don't know about Spacey's guest spots there, but um, Boogs was doing the Sundays um, before Spacey became a, a Sunday resident. 
and they used to have this guy Mark Strawn after Boogs, which his job was to like clear the room out. So, <laughs> what a job. And then like as Boogs was getting more and more popular and people were just like loving it. Like, could you just imagine the club full of everyone on pingers just having the best time ever? And then a DJ comes on and just like plays the music. Like, yeah, you. I can't even remember what he used to play, but I just remember like that feeling of like, anxiety and like, oh my god, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I just imagine. Where's the bangers? <laughs> I can imagine being in your job. It's like, sweet, I'm coming in like the cleaning man, <laughs> I'm up a, a, a bucket of mop. <laughs> And What's then, the worst songs in my catalogue? <laughs> and then I think, yeah, what, why was that his basic job? pattern. Why was that his job? I don't know why. I think <laughs> I, I, I don't know, even know if that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> he either like love clearing the dance floor, or they wanted to not have people there all day. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we used to always say. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's his job to clear the dance floor. Uh, <laughs> and then, well, yeah, I don't, yeah. And then Spacey took but over that I don't that know role. either, like Spacey laid a really good claim of why we need to keep the dance floor going. <laughs> <laughs> well, they offered it to him. But then, yeah, that's how Sunday started. And I used to do guest spots on Sundays as yeah, well. Yeah, I remember, yeah. I, other, I yeah. don't know how, but yeah. yeah. Just remember. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, because it's funny because like you go back to like back in those days, right? Like it was like yourself, T-Rex, Spacey, Boogs, whatever. Like yeah. there was no flies back then. Yeah, like there was no. no social media. There was no text outs even. It was just like you knew who was there and it was almost like that was – residencies was the big thing. Like residencies yes. now don't really exist that I know of. Like obviously there still is a revolver and yeah. some of those older format clubs, but it was such a major thing because like, you know, if I was – might have been in someone's kitchen at 7 a.m. and we decided we wanted to keep going, I knew what I was in for. So we'd yeah. go to revolver. Whereas if you went to somewhere where you didn't know what you were in for, you're less likely to go there again, yeah. right? And that's yeah. like one of those things, like, you know, talk about vinyl dying, but also like residencies are basically dead really. Yeah. Do you still have many residencies other than revolver? Um, I f uh, Revolver's definitely my, like, longest. I've, over the years, I've had some that are on and off or, or last for a few, five years or something like that. Circus I still play at. That's one club since, <laughs> like, Forever. the mid-2000s. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like, over the years. Um, and, I mean, I tend to play at the, like, Say even Storyville, for instance, that used to be TFU and then Wawa. Yeah. And so I'll still play there sometimes. So I still often play at the same clubs, like over the years. Getcha. But it would just be called something different. And same promoters and, and stuff. Like you played uh, yeah, like in hundreds years, of my gigs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll just rebrand or, yeah. So when you first started Revolver, you got your residency, you know, you, there's no doubt and no denying that the Revolver is one of the most unique venues in, in the world potentially, or even yeah. not top five. You would have seen some crazy shit. <laughs> I couldn't yeah. not ask this question yeah. and I know I'm putting you on the spot, but like, is this some like- Seen or done some crazy shit, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a bit of both. But um, is there some stuff you've seen that you can kind of share with us that, you know, that you look back on over those 20 years and just go, that's fucking weird. Or other stuff that's just like absolutely insane, but awesome. Probably or one of the craziest things that, like, well, there's a few crazy things that have happened on Saturday morning, but in the mid 2000s, Sven Bath just rocked up to, and he wanted to play and all like, are you serious? Of course, jump on. And he ended up playing my whole like five hours. Yeah, and I remember that. People were going mental and just everyone was giving him pingers. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was a really he good time. He would have been loving it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you had recently Fred again, right? He rocked up. That was on your set too? Yeah, that was mental. And what a legend. Like I've met a – I mean, he's pretty big, but I've met a lot of like bigger artists and I, I only met him that morning behind the decks kind of thing and – he was just such a down to earth guy and like, like had a really sick conversation, you know, it was really genuine in like in our conversation and stuff. And yeah, it was really sick. Was did you cool. find out about it like prior? Was it like, yeah, on I the knew morning? for two weeks. So. Oh, did you? Wow, that was a good kept secret. <laughs> then. Or like me and like the book of front revolver, <laughs> I knew for two weeks and we weren't allowed to tell a single soul because if word got out, they were going to cancel the show. Well, you did a good job because I, like, you know, every time someone like that comes in, everyone's like, where are they going to play? And it's like, starts to circulate. And normally it's like three, four days, the industry gets a hold of it. And I had zero idea. I heard rumours, but I heard a million other rumours about every fucking venue in Melbourne. Yeah, I just so. didn't go out at all and didn't drink at all. Well, <laughs> 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 so one of my best mates, I was trying to get her to come and I was like, oh, it's going to be really good. Like, you know, someone big's playing, but I can't say, I just said that to her. And the, she bloody guessed. Did <laughs> and, she? I, and I told her no, but <laughs> I said to come anyway. Yeah. So, and the pro, so you played, what time you wrote? Like 11 or something, didn't you? 
Um, he came at 8.30. Yep. Yep. And how did that all transpire? So he's come up and just started, just, just jumped on, took over. Um, so like there was some, his team and stuff rocked up early and uh, they told me when he was going to come and stuff like that. But uh, the two weeks before he was, um, he really wanted to do like a little party in Melbourne, uh, announce like, you know, a last minute Our surprise before. thing. Yeah. Uh, and he's really into doing it at, with grassroots artists of the city and stuff. So I wanted to know about me and, and that kind of stuff and my music and was like, yeah, sick, sweet. And yeah, it came down and played. It was yeah, awesome. That's mad. I remember seeing like the, the, the sea of people outside before and they ran all to Timber Yard and whatnot. Yeah. So who is that? Uh, is Sven Vath or, you know, Freddie Gang, you talk about these guys that have hijacked your set. Are they the biggest guys or is there other guys you can mention that were like the same sort of caliber? Because that's like a revolver thing, right? People coming up and hijacking. Oh, yeah. And... How good is it when you're on? I mean, Freddie Gimp wasn't on one, but like, Sven Vath was. When you're on one and you're at the club and you just want to jump on the decks. I understand that word. But uh, who else? I actually can't think of anyone. <laughs> can't think of anyone? <laughs> I can think of, oh no, Seth Troxler, that's right. Yeah, that's massive God. too. Yeah. And, oh, that was a few years ago. Yeah, he just rocked up and had so much fun. And like, that was crazy when he was there, even... Like, I saw over at the bar, like, all these flashes and cameras and stuff and, like, yeah, people... Like losing their minds. Losing their minds that he was just at the bar and then he came over and wanted to play and then he came the next week as well, yeah. Yeah, no shit, that's mad. Yeah. So, of all the gigs you've played there, you know, I'm guessing fucking thousands probably, maybe, or if not pretty close to, I'd say. I don't know, who's good at maths? <laughs> <laughs> not me. <laughs> Like 25 years every weekend plus all the hanging out yeah. <laughs> and the on, uh, impromptu sets. <laughs> <laughs> so um, is there like a, a number one that stand out moment for you in your career at Revolver that you like you never forget that you can run us through? Um, I think I think anyone who lo loves Revolver knows Revolver when it's off its tits and it's absolutely amazing and when I think back to good sets, it's mo it's just a kind of combination of moments like that where I just had the best time. Definitely my tenure was, like, really awesome. And I uh, remember people dancing on the couches, going wild. My 20-year last year, that was epic. Did, like, a 16-hour set. <laughs> and so I, I reckon I had another 20 hours left in me. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. Once I get started playing, like, I don't want to stop... What about the Disco Faith one? Pardon? The Disco Faith uh, set. Oh, that was, that was part of it? Or, or do you mean the No, nah, I remember sets? the original one you did and it was like, you oh, know, blew up Facebook back in the day. Like, that's not how long ago it was, but it was like, that was the medium that everyone was watching it. But I remember when it was going live and everyone was just losing their minds. Oh, that's right. Yeah, in 2017, did for, oh, it was the second choir show at Revolver. Yep. Like, the first one was at Prince and still, like, I was still, like, <laughs> if I had the recording of that, like, it's so, it was so, like, rough but the idea was like so raw and that the vibe that day was yeah sick yeah insane yeah sick, yeah so what with that like obviously you know you've been djing for at the time you know decades um what made you decide to sort of move into that live element with the the choir um i think it was like a progression it was um when i started writing music in like the early 2010s um i also like my biggest track at the time and still <laughs> one of the biggest tracks I've played is like Old Landmark, which is like a vocal reprise, uh, a gospel track. And I play um, Stevie Minks Now Now underneath that techno yeah, yeah, track. Yeah. Banger. <laughs> a banger, yeah. <laughs> Always a banger. <laughs> uh, but basically when I started writing tracks and learning to write tracks, I really wanted to do a gospel kind of like a gospel techno track basically. And um, after I'd written a few tracks – I was like, yeah, I want to. That's what I want to do now. Do this, this this gospel track. And through the process of writing that, which is a track here to stay, um, I like. I basically was trying to find a choir to sing on the track, and thinking like these choirs are going to be so excited to sing on my track and come and sing at the club at the release party. Turns out no. <laughs> <laughs> 2 a.m. in the club set isn't isn't that exciting, and it turned out like yeah, a bit of a challenge to find a, a choir, and so um, I ended up kind of putting together my own choir, and through that whole kind of process, um, came up with the name Disco Faith, and then once the track was ready as well, ended up starting a record label because um, I hadn't found the right fit for the track either, and then. Um, our first show was uh, 
it was basically the record release party. So the whole aim was just this one gig um, and got the choir, the choir sang three tracks and I like DJ with them and played like an instrumental in between and like, oh my God, I reckon that gig, that energy in that room was like one of the best like sets that I've done and it was like everyone there, it was like 500 people, all people would follow my music over the years and the energy that the like the live element created with the kind of journey of a DJ set was like unlike anything else I'd ever seen in any of the club gigs ever ever done and so and I was like oh my god this is what I want to do this is what I want to develop and then yeah since then that was like end of 2016 I've just been working really hard to develop the yeah Sunshine and Disco Faith Choir and now like now if you see a set it's like an hour like action pack like dance moves vocals every track and yeah lots of rehearsals and so how long how long did it take you to like you know go from concept to actually get into where it is now because now you're doing festivals and all kinds of stuff like that yeah. too uh well how many like seven years yeah seven years yeah, yeah. and so like so and, and that's like this is the, my, my full-time job is working on sunshine and disco faith choir basically yeah do you and do you, <laughs> do you do like rehearsals weekly and stuff like that or um no we do them for shows so yeah. um Depending, like, our next gig is Sydney My Music Bowl. Um, we're doing, like, the, the, the main stage, which is sick. From, uh, it's the Ministry of Sound, that classical party. That's unreal. Yeah. Like, so, from a frother from way back, like yourself. Well, I, I, like, That's I mean, the bowl. anybody who's, like, growing up musically in Melbourne, <laughs> like, to, like, play at the bowls, like, yeah. Yeah, Dream especially gig. doing that too. Like, that's yeah. fucking awesome for you. So, for that particular gig, we'll do a few rehearsals. Um yeah, depending on the gig is depending on how many rehearsals that we do. And then, uh, like, I'll spend I've, – I've started the prep already for that gig. So I'll, like, put all the set together and then, um, like, record out the kind of parts and stuff like that for the choir and then they learn and then we go to rehearsal and perfect that and then perfect – like, like we even film, like, the performance at rehearsals and stuff and, like – perfect all the dance moves, how people come in on, on, um, on and off stage and all that kind of stuff. So it's pretty intricate. Yeah, it's, um, it's been such an awesome experience because uh, like uh, initially why I added the live element too is to just keep challenging myself and keep feeling inspired and uh, instead of just doing the same kind of thing. And look, I, I still absolutely love DJing and it just, it's been just cool doing something else as well. But it's more like, um, maybe it's more like a band or something because you go and rehearse. Yeah, for sure. And, and I feel like that's and, and, and at the actual gig, um, I'm do, it's a performance. It's not so much a on the fly DJ set. So 100%. it's all very worked out. Because there's so many singers and moving parts and stuff. Yeah, yeah and you've got microphones and there's like cue points and all that yeah. sort of stuff. I feel like a lot of people would not understand because it looks like singers with DJs, but how much would actually go into it. But Well, yeah, a lot of people think that we just rock up and they just come on and jam. I tell you, <laughs> it's not going to sound as <laughs> as amazing. If, yeah. For sure, 100%. <laughs> if it's done like that. So yeah. what's some iconic moments uh, or like, you know, massive moments for that concept that you've done other than the one at Revolver? Obviously, you've done multiple since then. Yeah. Like festivals uh, look, we just did Golden Plains earlier this year, which was epic. So epic. Oh, my God. It was like uh, we are on at one in the morning and it was like 12,000 people or whatever. That was yeah, that's mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you've done? Have you done BTV and stuff? Yeah, we did BTV. Um, that was main stage as well. Yeah, we've had a big year actually. Summer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> New Year's Eve BT, BTV main stage. Oh, we did like all oh, the Australian Open gigs were really cool. We did those, and then um, flew to Darwin as well this year. Did Bass in the Grass, which yeah. is the biggest festival up there. That was incredible. It was like hot. <laughs> really hot the choir were like dying in their gowns <laughs> but yeah it was pretty so, funny but. going from like that right where you're doing Australian Open you know BTV Golden Plains is probably a little bit more elect, uh, eclectic yeah but like from Revolver to there like how's that transition been because like you've always been relatively underground artist now you're yep. sort of working in this more it's not commercial because the music's definitely not commercial well, but. to be honest the choir sound is the sunshine sound that I was really well known for like um for especially in that like 2010 kind of era, yeah. So it's the like, choir sound is the sunshine banger sound. Like, yeah, I getcha. All, all my like, 
And that then and, and my DJ sets is how I work out the new choir tracks as well. Yeah. Like lots of those are kind of mixes that I've done in my set or like bootlegs I might have made for my DJ set and then once it's tried and tested, then I put it in the choir set. Yeah, Matt, that's awesome. Yeah. And what's next for that? Like other than, you know, the upcoming bowl stuff, like where, where do you sort of see it going? Um, <clears throat> look, my, my aim for the choir is the world stage, definitely. Yeah. I'd love to be just touring the world and like closing festivals and already we're developing like the stage show and doing big props and like I really want to um, get like those trapeze, the little wires. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And like get kind of elevated down or like lifted up and then kind of slowly put down behind the decks with lighting behind me. That's mad. <laughs> They'd be like pink but you instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll be flipping to the MCG oh, in no time. Yeah, I love good costumes and stage show and then oh, obviously the music as well but yeah. Yeah, that's sick. So um, gigs you've played over Melbourne, like you've, there's no doubt you've played every venue that exists, right? Yeah. Is there sort of like if you wound it back, is there ones that you can look at other than Revolver that – you loved or, you know, like highlight gigs or just venues that sort of – Over hold, the years. Yeah, over the years, a whole special sort of um, place in your I heart. I thought Survival was very special, yeah, at the bottom end. Yeah. Uh, and also probably, like, that's my element, like a uh, big room but underground. So yeah. I, I love playing to a big room but underground sets, yeah. Yeah, TFU? Hey, oh, my God, TFU. <laughs> love TFU. <laughs> Which yes. one? Which venue? Um – uh, so the original, like, Wawa. Yeah, War yeah, Waratah <laughs> Place, yeah. like, that's the OG. And then the, um, the Lonsdale Street. Yeah, 100%. Because um, I, I started going in 2012 again, like, on the Sundays. Yeah. It was sick. It was, yeah. It was like Travelers and Zachy D. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah was that was fun. like Tramp Era. Hey, yeah. That was like Tramp Era too, yeah. Fun Tramp Era, yeah. Yeah. You go Tramp and then... I don't know, kick on and then tear you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any wild party stories that you can tell us about that aren't related to DJing? Um, oh, I had my favourite kick on house, which was from that era as well. It was called HQ. Yep. Mango would know that one. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember it. Yeah. And look, anyone who knows me knows I'm a fan of a dancing kick on, not a sit down kick on. <laughs> And that kick on, you play on the decks, everyone would be dancing on the coffee table, on the couches. And yeah, it was five months of like some of the best times I've had, definitely. I hope you don't mind me asking this one, but there's a story that I know of. And back, this is when we used to have the tour of Googs at Fake Tits. Yeah. And um, one of our DJs won it, but you were in attendance with him. Do you know the story I'm talking about? Uh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, there's any, a lot of stories, but yeah, yeah. So for anyone that didn't know, the back then we used to have fake tits was a tramp on Fridays and the two of the Googs was basically like a cycling jersey that whoever had the trash bag his story would win, um, which you couldn't do these days, but that, you know, the times are different. And um, you and Asmac, one of the good boys from Asmac teamed up. If you could yeah. run us through that, that'd be fucking a good yarn. Well, I was at fake tits that night. I think I might have played or I went for Spacey's set, but... Basically got, got very lit, was having a great time and then went and did my five hours at Revolver and... I just remembered something. <laughs> and Macca came as well and uh, then like after Rev sh shut, we're looking for a kick on and we're like, Fuck, where are we, we going to go? I was like, I think Killing Time's open. And so I went up to Killing Time and it wasn't open and... Uh, then we tried to go around the back to see if it was open and then Macca climbed the fence and opened the gate and... Yeah, like at the time I didn't really think I was doing anything <laughs> wrong, like breaking and entering. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted a kick on and then I um, invited a couple of friends down and we turned on the decks and started playing like Melbourne bangers on the decks. And then a few hours went past and um, Cam from Killing Time came down and he's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, oh, we just wanted to play on the deck. <laughs> and... As you could imagine, wasn't he wasn't very happy yet, no. And I uh, understand. I, I felt very bad the next day. <laughs> I remember Macca saying that so I went down to the 24-hour bottle shop and bought piss too. Yeah. So you were just drinking death <laughs> plate on the desk. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, fuck, now I've lost my train. <laughs> So, you know, you're working with these other guys in Melbourne, you being one of them too, like, you know, I touched on before, but like institutional artists, like Boog, Spacey, T-Rex and stuff like that. What sort of the relationship with those guys been and sort of like you working alongside them for so long? Um, I think it's a mutual respect of, you know, when you've been in the industry for this long and also 
probably what's different between us as well. We get constantly new young kind of people into our music. So it's not like um, other like really kind of institutional DJs from the past or really big DJs from the past in Melbourne who their fan base grew older and then stopped going out. Yep. And I would say that's because of Revolver and, and the parties that we play that it's constant new people, uh, new young people coming out and then getting into our music. Yeah, I think also yeah. too like tastemakers, right? Like back, you, know, you would have heard this term before, but people would be like, Rev's music. Yeah. And that, that you guys sort of coined that. And it's like, how would you even explain that? If somebody doesn't really understand what Rev's music is, because it well, basically- it's the music that we play. Yeah, so exactly right, yeah. That's, and, and it's the music that, yeah, it's the music that we play and over the years, um, people have come and loved and then that's turned into Rev's yeah. music. I mean, Rev's does lots of music. They do all kinds of music. They have hip hop nights, they have band nights and stuff, but the recovery music is definitely, yeah. And if you I had mean, to give it a genre, which I, I don't think is possible, but if you had to give it a genre for what you guys have played over the past two decades, what would you say? Good kick on music. <laughs> I don't know. That's <laughs> no. probably a good term, but hey, like it's true. Like you look back at times when I we used to go and let's say there was nothing that sounded like that. Like you'd go to like all these other venues and you know it was like Electro at TFU or House at One Love and then you go to Revs and it was Revs music. Yeah. And it was like back then it was like it could be anything from a prince. Um, I, it, well, uh, I don't know how you'd put it into a genre, but it was basically like heaps of sick underground music, but also – it didn't matter if you played a Moose T track or, or like some big track that maybe was played at One Love or, or something like that. It was just a good track was a good track, whether it was a big track or an underground track. It was just. But I remember even tracks. like originals getting chucked in, like Womack and Womack, yeah. And like there'd yeah. be these like a slow, um, you know, book of shade into not even uh, a cappella over a remix. It was legit yeah. just fucking like Prince is when Doves Cry just yeah. straight up. I remember this. that with Ripping Kitten. Yeah, every <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, what what made you guys start that? Like, who? How did that even transpire? Because obviously, there's nowhere in I've been anywhere in the world that plays the sort of music that you guys decided to start playing. But like, what do you think fundamentally created that? Like, from being was involved with Revolver from the start. Maybe it's a fact that we all just play what we loved and didn't try and play what other people were playing. I don't know. Yeah. And they allowed you to do that, Revolver. Like, or maybe it's Revolver who knew how to pick the right. DJs People, yeah, true. Good who point. like had their own sound and uh, I know with all of us if you walked into the room and didn't know who was playing you'd know who was playing one million percent 100 and so yeah maybe it was Revolver who knew how to pick the those artists. people who like had a really strong kind of vision in their sound yeah because yeah. it's yeah I can't, you're right because you could hear it doesn't matter where you were you could hear the this or, or maybe it's just because we're all like massive music lovers <laughs> yeah, so, yeah yeah fundamentally yeah yeah it's and an interesting thing we're all, all in it for the music like it wasn't yeah we just love music and love playing and then awesome if people were dancing <laughs> yeah 100 yeah. but it's like you know it's, a, it's just a special thing because like again there's only one revolver yeah people yeah. like seth troxler or like fred again or like um sven vath they want to play there like even artists yeah. i've traveled and bought over from overseas the first thing they do is when they touch down is like hey is there a way that I can play at Revolver? And as you know, they're not getting paid to play there. Like, it's <laughs> no, no one is. <laughs> <laughs> they get the same fee as a resident gets yeah. fee as there. Yeah. So it's like, um, so overseas, like you got all these people coming from everywhere all over the world. Like what kind of, how, what kind of people have you met there? From what countries have you met there in Revolver? Uh, all countries, like a, a, every week as well. I have people like from like Germany, from like South America, from England, from yeah, everywhere. Who will be like, oh my God, I discovered this place like oh, last weekend, I'm here for three weeks <laughs> or I'm here for three months. Or, like, and uh, the one thing over the years, the whole time that I've played at Revs, it's always the same type of person that falls in love with Revolver. So dress sense might change, like what's cool in the fashion at the time might change but over the years it's the same type of people and it's the only club that I play at still where like I'll see regulars from like maybe 15 years ago who come once every year or two or yeah and they still hold the same love for the place and you can go there by yourself lots of people go go there by themselves yeah and it's a collective they lash their other friends <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah I'm going home to bed <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's an eclectic place like I remember my first time ever going there and it was like walking up the stairs and I would have been like 19 maybe. I was young. I was with like Brenton Peterson, no doubt you yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. And um, he was taking me there for the first time sort of discovering. And that was like when you did discover. Like it wasn't like, you know, someone told me about it. I just went with them. And Sasha, do you remember Sasha? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's red. That's not relevant to the story. But anyway, <laughs> I was going upstairs with them. So we were walking upstairs and I remember like, you know, looking up those giant stairs and they had the cage on the side. And when I got there, their door chick gave me the admission ticket, like the admit one ticket. I remember walking into the place. And I was like, what the fuck is this joint? Yeah, and like, I've never seen anything like it. And no doubt, like an hour later, like the, the, the sun starts coming through and everyone's dancing. It's like almost like as the sun hit the dance floor, it like peaked up and you guys are playing behind the cage. And, and you know, I was meeting Irish people, Brazilian people, like all these different people from all yeah. over the world. I was meeting people from the LGBTQ community. I was meeting yeah. hip hop fans. Yeah. <clears throat> and it was like this eclectic mix of humans. It makes it so special. But it's like, what, do you think it's an accident, the way it's happened? Or do you think it was actually uh, choreographed? Uh, I think it may no. I think accident. Yeah, for sure. Because the travelers, awesome. like, if you're traveling, who else can go bendering every weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Especially when Reds was like open from Friday to Monday. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I remember, like, the other thing I think too is that you know you travel overseas and you'll be like, I'm I, from Melbourne, and everyone's like, Oh, revolver, like, straight away. Like yeah. everyone knows it. it's like worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it's a very, very special club. Yeah. What does revolver mean to you? Uh, revolvers. Like my home, it's my musical home. I reckon I've spent more hours there than any house I've lived at, <laughs> for sure, definitely. <laughs> and and like I've met, you know, my best friends there. Like I've met so many special people in my life at Revolver. I've had so many special moments. And I just, when I walk up the stairs, I feel like I've come home. It's just like this, yeah. And I, I like, yeah. I, and I appreciate it even more, especially when I've been doing like, uh, traveling with the choir a bit and not playing for a few weeks or whatever and then I come back and I play at revs and yeah I f yeah I miss it <laughs> <laughs> I like, love yes it. I'm back home so it's but, like your first love hey yeah yeah, yeah. what's next My for love, is love. <laughs> your love is love <laughs> um what's next for sunshine um I've got a few new tunes that are going to come out soon uh sunshine originals and choir as well which is exciting yeah the ball coming up obviously Yep, bowl coming up. Um, the choirs also do Ocean Sounds. Um, I think we're in Sydney New Year's as well. And um, yeah, a few festivals over summer. Yeah, Matt, <laughs> awesome. So when you first came into Melbourne, right, like there, I'm assuming there wasn't a whole lot of female DJs in the industry at the time. No, yeah. So how, was that challenging, you know, being two decades? Like I know it can be still challenging now, but at the moment there's a lot of massive female artists. But when you were coming up, even from my memory, you were one of maybe, you know, two or three massive female artists. Was that a challenge coming up or not really? Uh, yes, in some ways. And then um, knowing other, like, I just look, the way I've always looked at myself is I've just wanted to be an awesome DJ girl or guy, it does not matter. I've never, like, that's how I've kind of looked at it. But I remember, like, playing gigs at Revolver and if I'd, like, stuff up a mix on vinyl or whatever and having guys, like, boo and stuff like that, more so than they would if, if I was a guy. But then the opposite would happen if I like absolutely slayed a mix and, and killed it, you'd get even more like attention from that and, and people giving you more props or more gigs or, or whatever. Um, and also stuff like, and I know this because I used to compare stories like Boogs and Spacey, but I'd be playing and I'd turn around and some guys like going through my records or something like that. You'd get a lot of kind of guys trying to push you around again. <laughs> yeah, punters compared to the guy DJs. Right. I don't know, I just put my head down and just always made sure I did a great job and, yeah. So how did you stand up to him? When Get people the fuck did. out. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Exactly. And, and, like, and then, like, nowadays, I guess it's been a long time since I've kind of made a name for myself in Melbourne, so it just, I don't really think about it. I just always try and... I walk into every set like it's like my last and always just make sure I do a good job whether I'm feeling crap or, or whatever, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to wrap it up there. I want to cool. say thank you so much for coming down today on this beautiful Tuesday morning. Cool. Um, thanks for having me. That, I appreciate <laughs> it. And thanks for telling us your yarns over the last two decades in Melbourne. And thank you so much for being such a pivotal part of our, our industry and the soul of Melbourne. Like without yourself and your peers, I don't know if Melbourne is as special as it is. So I guess that's a thank you from me to everyone in Melbourne. Oh, yeah. um, without your music taste, without your wanting fury to like become a DJ, you know, Revolver's maybe not as special, Melbourne's not as special. And these people who looked up to you guys as you came, they came along on their journeys, maybe aren't as special without you guys. I want to say thank you for inspiring others. Oh, uh, thank you very much. That means a lot. Like, um, look, I'm just as much as a punter and, and for, for music as I am DJ. So no, it means a lot. 
So lastly, before I finish up and say goodbye to you completely, I've got to say, I've got to shout out my sponsors because without them, the lights aren't on, right? So number one is I'm the brand of, this is a gift for you. Oh, yay. Wet Kitty. No <laughs> doubt you've had some wet pussy shots in your time. Yes, if you've been lot. working in clubs, <laughs> I think everybody has, right? Um, so shout out to them. You can buy this at First Choice, Liquor Land, around the country and all good independents. Triple A Digital, if you're looking to enhance your hospitality, business, events or festivals, hit them up because they have strategy for days. And lastly, but not least, I'm not wearing it. I'm repping Poppy, Posse Shop, Melbourne fucking boys. <laughs> but I still owe the label. I can go check them out online. Their link will be in the description. So their quality of their clothes is ridiculous. And it's actually made by a couple of promoters in Melbourne. So no, not only should you wear them because they're good quality, but you should support them because you're supporting fucking promoters and we're legends. So thank you, Sunny, for coming down today. I really appreciate <laughs> your time. <laughs> um, and yeah, keep fucking doing your thing.